the Poet Laureate of the United States, Billy Collins. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, going, I'm very pleased to be part of this, this poetry summit. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to begin by reading a poem about you. Uh, it's about my reader. Uh, I suppose if you've read me or if you plan to read me, you would be in that group. Sometimes there's not much to write about, and so I just write, I just write something to the reader. <clears throat> it's called You Reader. I wonder how you are going to feel when you find out that I wrote this instead of you. That it was I who got up early to sit in the kitchen and mention with a pen the rain-soaked windows, the ivy wallpaper, and the goldfish circling in its bowl. Go ahead and turn aside, bite your lip, and tear out the page. But listen, it was just a matter of time before one of us happened to notice the unlit candles and the clock humming on the wall. Plus, nothing happened that morning. A song on the radio, a car whistling along the road outside. And I was only thinking about the shakers of salt and pepper that were standing side by side on a placemat. I wondered if they had become friends after all these years. <laughs> or if they were still strangers to one another, like you and I, who managed to be known and unknown to each other at the same time. Me at this table with a bowl of pears. You leaning in a doorway somewhere near some blue hydrangeas reading this. I have a poem which is has a little poem in back of it. The poem in back of it is the Yeats's poem, The Wild Swans at Cool. And it's in that poem that Yeats sees a, a kind of display of swans and he begins to count them. And I think he gets to 59 and then they all take flight. And I usually take a walk in the morning around this body of water with the dog and there are often swans there. And I've, a while back I started to count them just thinking that if Yeats did it I should probably... <clears throat> It probably wouldn't hurt to do that. <laughs> and they're easy to count because they're, they stand out and it's not like counting sparrows or something like that. <laughs> they don't move around a lot. And I started getting a very subtle emotional reaction to this because knowing um, how swans have this very deep and abiding understanding of monogamy, if I would count the swans and there'd be an even number, I'd feel kind of good. You know, I'd feel like there was kind of a mood of domestic tranquility. But if I came up with an odd number, I would, I would kind of look out there to wonder which was the odd bachelor or, <laughs> or the widower. <clears throat> the poem uh, ends up there, but it really begins as a definition, a rolling definition of the word genius. Genius was what they called you in high school if you tripped on a shoelace in the hall and all your books went flying. Or if you walked into an open locker door, you would be known as Einstein, who imagined reading a street car, riding a streetcar into infinity. Later, genius became someone who could take a sliver of chalk and squire pie a hundred places out beyond the decimal point or someone painting on his back on a scaffold, or a man drawing a water wheel in a margin, or spinning out a little night music. But earlier this week on a wooded path, I thought the swans afloat on the reservoir were the true geniuses, the ones who had figured out how to fly, how to be both beautiful and brutal, and how to mate for life. Twenty-four geniuses in all, for I numbered them, as Yeats had done, deployed upon the calm, crystalline surface. Forty-eight, if we count their white reflections, or an even fifty, if you want to throw in me and the dog running up ahead, who were at least smart enough to be out there that morning, she sniffing the ground, me with my head up in the light morning breeze. I don't know if... Uh, I have a... I must <clears throat> add to uh, Lucille's <clears throat> um, meditation on sheep. I came. Out, I wrote this very short poem after reading, <clears throat> excuse me, and a sentence in an article 
on printing, and the sentence simply said, it has been calculated that each copy of the Gutenberg Bible required the skins of 300 sheep. And I've written a very short poem called Flock. I can see them squeezed into a holding pen behind the stone building where the printing press is housed, all of them squirming around in search of a little room and all looking so much alike it would be extremely difficult to count them and there is no telling which one of them will carry the news that the Lord is a shepherd. <laughs> one, one of the few things they already know. <clears throat> it almost... We're on our way to an anthology of sheep poems. I don't know um, if, um, if I say lanyard, if that has any resonance for you, but uh, that's the title of this poem. It's called The Lanyard. The other day, as I was ricocheting slowly off the blue walls of this room, bouncing from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, I found myself in the L section of the dictionary, where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one more suddenly into the past, a past where I sat at a workbench at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake, learning to braid thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one, <laughs> but that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts, <laughs> and I gave her a lanyard. <clears throat> she nursed me in many a sick room, lifted teaspoons of medicine to my lips, set cold face cloths on my forehead, and then led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim, and I in turn presented her with a lanyard. <laughs> Here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing and a good education. And here is your lanyard, I replied, <laughs> which I made with a little help from a counselor. <laughs> here is a breathing body and a beating heart, strong legs, bones and teeth, and two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here I said is the lanyard I'd made at camp. <laughs> and here, I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift not the archaic truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hands, I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. <clears throat>